In this next video for Introduction to Neuroscience, we're going to be looking at non-invasive methods to measure neuroactivity in neuroscience. In the last couple of lectures, we talked at length about all the different really cool techniques that are invasive for measuring neuroactivity. They have included different ways of opening up the skull, putting in different electrodes, stick them far inside the brain, um, putting animals under microscopes so that you can see transgenic animals that express different kinds of opsins that glow in the dark so that you can see their neural activity, as well as different toxins, potentially toxic substances that you can pipette onto neurons so that you can see what's going on and manipulate the activity. So that's all really great, especially if you're interested in animal organisms for which it is experimentally accessible and tractable for you to do those techniques in a laboratory setting. What's not really doable is doing that for humans in the vast majority of the cases. It is fortunate that some of these um, experiments are possible to do in humans because they piggyback on top of clinical applications. Um, that's the case we talked about with Jan, where she had these BCI electrodes inside her inside her uh, cortex, and she was able to operate that robotic arm and um, and also fly an F-35 flight simulator. So that was really cool. But that has to be piggybacked on top of clinically relevant um, uh, ex uh, clinically relevant treatments. Um, what's happening when there is not a clinical need to do something super invasive like brain surgery is that we really need a set of techniques to study humans and other non-human species that are not invasive at all, that don't require brain surgery, transgenic animals, and all of the rest of it. So what can we do here? Well, one of the things that's really commonly done is this really cool technique called magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, and in particular, functional magnetic resonance imaging. The insight here is that because the brain communicates with electricity, and electricity and magnetism, E and M, are duals of each other, anytime you have electrical activity, it induces a change in the magnetic field, and so a magnet can actually pick up electrical activity if you had a sufficiently large and strong one. So that's the fundamental you know, physical intuition behind why it is possible to image brain activity with a magnet. So the magnetic resonance imaging machine is a, usually a long, big machine like this. You actually put the entire uh, participant human inside of it, and you're resting inside this chamber where you're surrounded by a giant magnet. The giant magnet makes a ton of noise. You're in there, and your brain is being imaged, and this is super cool, right? Um, it is not only a tool for neuroscience, but these MRIs are really commonly found in hospitals as well as a clinical diagnostic tool. The same magnets can be, can be co-opted for use in neuroscience research. Um, sometimes this is done in off hours, when, the, when, like at nights, for example, a participant will go in and, and do an experiment in one of these magnetic resonance imaging machines. Um, for those of you, this is just a tidbit, for those of you who might know a little bit more about chemistry and physical chemistry, the MRI, it's fundamentally exactly the same technology as an NMR, a nuclear magnetic resonance imaging system. So NMR spectroscopy is something that, that chemists use for, um, for, for, for imaging the spectroscopy of different small molecules. Um, and the only real difference is that the magnet for an NMR machine, instead of being horizontal, is usually vertical, because you just put the vial inside, right? So it's usually some chemicals you put inside instead of a human. A human doesn't really like being bound and stuck inside a chamber vertically, and so we put it sideways and then go down. Um, the reason they renamed it, even though it's fundamentally the same physics, is because they didn't want the word nuclear in this machine. And so instead of calling it NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, it's called magnetic resonance imaging MRI, just so that that word is not in there um, and it doesn't elicit um, wrong associations in people's mind when they get inside one of these machines. So. Functional magnetic resonance imaging uses the same machine, you're in the same magnet, and the person's laying in there, but you're using a slightly different observation, which is known as the BOLD effect, the blood oxygenation level dependent effect. And the fundamental observation is that when neurons are active, when they're firing a lot, doing something, doing something, whatever that means, they consume more oxygen, okay? Which means that the vasculature the blood vessels that are supplying that part of the brain with, oxygen, with oxygenated blood is going to have to deliver more oxygen. And those oxygenated, those oxygenated um, molecules, hemoglobin, is going to get consumed and, uh, and stripped of their oxygen more quickly. It turns out that under the right conditions, oxygenated hemoglobin can be different from deoxygenated hemoglobin under magnetic stimulation. And so that by a clever trick, the magnet is able to tell the difference between the areas of the brain that have relatively more or less oxygenated hemoglobin. That's the reason functional fMRI works. fMRI works because 
deoxygenated hemoglobin and oxygenated hemoglobin appear differently under magnetic resonance imaging. That's why we have these hot spots in there. And that's really cool because it is not at all invasive. A human can get inside this tube and have behaviorally relevant neural activity that can be imaged volumetrically all the way to deep structures without having anything invasive or any ill effects afterwards besides, you know, people, some people are claustrophobic and they can't get inside the magnet. Um, it's also really loud, um, so whatever. So you can do this, it's not invasive and you can detect behaviorally relevant neural activity. The limitations are because there's this huge level of complexity and proxies in terms of what's happening. You know how we talked about how intracellular recordings have potentials that are larger than extracellular recordings because it's outside? If you imagine that electrical activity now going through, not only just right outside the cell, it's now going through a bunch of other cells. There's the cerebrospinal fluid, there's the meninges, and there's the skull, and then there's this hair, and then there's scalp, and then there's this magnets outside of it. The signals that you're detecting are extraordinarily small. And so there's a lot of averaging that goes on in functional MRI. And it's also unclear exactly how neuroactivity maps onto this blood oxygenation. This is a subject of much debate, and I think it is still unclear exactly what that means. Does more bold mean more neurons firing? It's unclear what the answer is. The other trade-off here is that it's relatively slow. We know that an action potential, it takes up approximately one millisecond, so it's super fast, right? GCAM is already slower than that because we have this um, uh, decay effect but based on the convolutional filter of the molecular properties of the GCAM molecule. We talked about that in the optical imaging section of the lecture in the previous, in, in the previous video. fMRI is significantly slower than that. It has approximately a five, minute, five second delay between the bolt signal going up and when you can actually see it in the scanner. And it has a resolution of approximately one second, which means anything that happens faster than a second, you just can't tell. You can't tell at all. You can't tell that something is either changing or not changing when it's, when it's happening faster than one second. Now, people have been pushing this technology, so there are better ways of doing magnetic scanning now that is um, faster and have better resolution than what I'm saying here. So this is kind of a ballpark. But we're still orders of magnitude different than the intrinsic neural activity of a neuron, which is on the order of a millisecond. And the final limitation is obviously the participant must be lying down in a loud tube. So this restricts the types of things that we can study. You can study watching movies, and that's what people do a lot. You can put headphones on participants, so you can study you know, you know, visual auditory integration, stuff like that. The person must be pretty still, and their head can't move, and so you're obviously not gonna be using MRI to study things like how do you walk and balance, right? Um, and you're not gonna be doing anything that has to do with, let's say, social interactions that involve the person having, um, uh, be, being able to interact with another person by sitting across from them and actually being able to see them. People have done experiments where you can put participants um, basically in, in, in a virtual conference where they're each laying in their own tube and they can kind of see each other with our screens, super cool experiments, but still that's a little bit different than the actual interaction that we're having with each other if we were in the same room talking to each other and being able to look at each other. So those are the strengths and weaknesses of fMRI. Um, one other weakness is that only humans can be told to lay still in a tube. Um, so even though there are magnet bores that are uh, designed for smaller animals and other species, it's really difficult to get them to lay still and not struggle in this loud tube. Um, that's kind of weird and kind of weird. Um, <laughs> except there have been attempts to train dogs to lay still. So you can study dog neuroscience. So there's these dog, um, dog lovers. I'm, I'm, I'm one of them who are saying, this is really, just really adorable that you can get these dogs uh, to train them to lie still and they, they do extensive training to lie still and uh, consent to have themselves be scanned by lying still inside one of these magnets. Um, so that's just a, a charming little story about fMRI and dogs. The other story I really like to tell about fMRI is the subject of the Ig Nobel Prize in 2012. Um, so the Ig Nobel Prize, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, is <laughs> it's, a, it's a play on the Nobel Prize for research that is frivolous in kind of a funny and charming way. So in this particular experiment, a bunch of fMRI researchers decided to do the following. They decided to, to repeat the same experiment that they usually do in humans. In this case, they show the pictures uh, of different faces of other humans and ask them what that person is feeling. Are they sad? Are they happy? Stuff like that, okay? But instead of showing it to a human participant, they decided, I mean, this actually happened because they were just calibrating the machine, right? They're like, oh, let's put something in there. So 
they put a dead salmon in there. They literally went to the store, to the grocery store, and it got a whole Atlantic salmon and stuck the dead salmon inside the magnet and showed it the same experiment that they were showing the humans, asking the salmon the question, was the person happy or not? The salmon, of course, did not actually behave. It refused to participate in the study. Nevertheless, when they ran the analytic tools afterwards and took the data from the fMRI machine, trying to correlate the brain areas that are associated with the perception of the emotional state of the picture of the person that's being shown, they, thought, they found that there were statistically significant voxels inside that dead salmon's brain that was uh, <laughs> that passed the test uh, for for having a representation of the emotional state of the of the person whose picture was being shown. Now they obviously knew what they were doing, and they knew how silly this was because they wrote up this 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 very snarky paper and published it in the Journal of Serendipitous and Unexpected Results in 2010. And the point here is not that this is full of BS, it's that the version of the software they used, and they know this, right, it's why they wrote the paper, did not properly account for what's called multiple comparisons correction. So this is a statistical term to mean that when you are looking for something that is statistically significant, but you're looking for not in one measurement or two measurements, but a gigantic set of measurements, like all the voxels in the brain, the chances of you finding it are not low. The chance of you finding it in at least one of those tests, because they're independent tests for every voxel, is not low. So you actually have to correct for what passes the bar of being a significant result based on how many voxels you're making, how many multiple comparisons are you making. And so this is a, this is a statistical result, but wrote up in a really charming way by a bunch of fMRI researchers pointing out and poking fun at the fact that this is a field in which, just like lots of other fields, we must be really careful with the analyses and the data analysis the analytic methods we are choosing to use. There's a couple more methods that I will point out that are of relevance for uh, non-invasive technologies for measuring neural activity. The most common ones you'll hear of are MEG and EEG. MEG is magnetic encephalography. It is um, similar to fMRI in that it is intrinsically a magnetic way of measuring neural activity. It is different because it's a smaller footprint and it, you can actually sit up, you're not inside a giant magnet, it's not nearly, nearly as loud. Um, and so you can do MEG, for example, in this case, with babies because you have them sit there. They will not lay down an fMRI machine for you. They just won't do it, right? Like try to take a baby and put them in a giant, bore hole and put them in there, they will not be happy. But they can be made to be happy sitting in their little car seat and being put under a MEG machine. The strength are just like an fMRI, it's not invasive, it does detect behaviorally irrelevant activity, it has pretty good temporal resolution, so it has much, much better temporal resolution than fMRI does because it's actually measuring magnetic activity instead of this bold signal, and it can detect much faster changes as a result. The limitations are, as you may expect, the signals are really tiny, so they can be quite noisy. And um, unlike fMRI, because you're measuring the magnetic field on the outside, it doesn't penetrate on the inside, it gets a little bit harder to detect deeper three-dimensional structures. So, so the resolution, spatially speaking, is better on the outside of the brain than is on the inside. EEG is very similar except that instead of having magnet, you're actually putting electrodes directly onto the scalp of the individual. So in electroencephalography, you see a picture like this one, where you see uh, an array of electrodes, usually with some kind of gel, electrically conductive gel, that gets stuck onto the surface of the person's head. Now, this technology, the trade-offs are that it's super cheap. <laughs> it's by far the cheapest type of way to non-invasively measure a neural activity. Um, and it is relatively more portable because as you can see, each electrode is small and all you need to do is keep track of the wires. And so unlike MEG and fMRI, it is possible to do EEG on let's say uh, a, a person who is who's running or walking and balancing on a treadmill. It is possible to do that with EEG and that's just categorically not possible to do with MEG or fMRI. Now they can't be doing anything really fast and crazy, like you probably can't put an EEG inside a football helmet and watch what happens when people hit their heads. It's just too much motion artifact, it won't work, but it is much more portable than MEG or fMRI would be. So uh, here is a picture again of what I showed a couple of, uh, a couple of a couple of videos ago in introducing the concept of why I'm spending so much time talking to you about technologies and different ways that we can look at uh, brain activation. So this is the same picture again where on the vertical axis we have different size scales and logarithmic coordinates from the level of a synapse all the way up to the brain. 
And on the horizontal axis, we have different time scales from milliseconds to days and months to years, okay? So in this paper, Terry Sonowski and his colleagues, um, I think it was Pat Churchland and Tony Mofshin, they ended their paper, their review paper, with the following sentence. I really like it, so I'm just gonna read it to you, okay? We talked a lot about different ways of manipulating and imaging and recording neural activity. And I told you about how cool it is that we now can do this faster, bigger, longer, and better resolution in time and space. Everything is getting better, right? And what that really means for us is that the challenge of what it means, the bottleneck in understanding the brain is just moving forward. And what they say here is we need to cultivate a new generation of computationally trained researchers who are aware of the richness of data and can draw on knowledge from many laboratories, courageous enough to make judicious simplifications, this is important because not every single thing is important, and to have their ideas tested and imaginative enough to generate interesting, testable, large-scale ideas. So this I see as a, as a, as a charge to the community, right? Um, it's a charge not, in terms of, not only in terms of uh, those of us who are already doing research in neuroscience, but in terms of how we train the next generation of computationally fluent neuroscientists and biologists. And so this whirlwind tour through the different technologies, especially how much they have gotten better in the past decades and how this progress is only accelerating, I think it really underlines this point that was uh, that's articulated here and how important it is for all of us to be able to be think a bit differently because analyzing a single neuron requires a very different mathematical and computational skill set as analyzing 10,000 neurons and that's just a different beast altogether and we all need to be able to cope with that so here's a summary of the non-invasive recording tech methods that we talked about for mostly for humans but you can use them for other animals as well uh, they don't require brain surgery which is really good and the general trade-off is that they have less specificity and more poor resolution we talked about fMRI which makes use of the bold effect the blood oxygenation level uh, effect to infer cell activity in brain volumes we can go all the way down which is really cool but you kind of have a trade-off in that it has poor temporal resolution we have MEG which has better temporal resolution and EEG, which has really good temporal resolution, but it has trade-offs that it generally is the least expensive and most portable of these techniques. Um, but the trade-off is that it has the worst signal quality. Uh, you usually have to repeat the same trial over and over and over and over and really average to get a signal that rises from the noise. And it's also, um, like all of these other techniques, prone to electrical noise and movement artifacts. Now, I chose to highlight these three techniques here, but there are actually a couple of other really cool emerging technologies in terms of non-invasive recording techniques that are relevant. For example, people are working on infrared imaging technologies. Um, it is possible to use ultrasound to infer neural activity. Um, really, there's a lot of really creative solutions being, being proposed and being tested and being actively developed right now. So I think there's a lot of room for innovation in terms of applications of these non-invasive recording methods, especially in humans, especially for clinical, but as well as recreational applications. The applications of what we can do if we can infer neural activity in healthy um, populations of individuals, participants that are not in a clinical context, that the population is just much, much larger than the clinical context. And so for that reason, I think it's really cool to be able to work on these technologies and really pushing the boundaries of data analysis to see how much we can overcome the challenges, the intrinsic noisiness of the data, and really infer what's going on underneath and use that in more and creative different ways.